I have Senator Cruz on the line, a Republican from Texas. He's also got a new book out, which we will discuss momentarily. One Vote Away, How a Single Supreme Court Seat Can Change History, which is a great title. Senator, it's great to have you on. Uh, by way of segue, I was just playing some clips of the former First Lady, Michelle Obama, and just painting this picture of America as this horrifically racist place. Uh, but the Black Lives Matter Antifa movement as incredibly peaceful, all about racial solidarity. Uh, do you think anyone is buying this message? Because I'm afraid they are. That's the thing that I fear. Well, they're certainly hoping uh, that that the, the typical voter will not notice how angry and extreme and radicalized the far left is, and, and yes. it's the reason it's the reason the news every day is so shameless with with fake news. It's the reason why the coverage every day is peaceful protest, peaceful protest. I mean, you you, you remember the CNN Chiron of fiery but peaceful protest of a reporter literally in front of a building on fire. Uh, There's a reason they do it, which is they think that people who may not be paying all that much attention, that the the propaganda works. And and they're simultaneously trying to inflame racial divisions and enrage people on racial lines and at the same time convince other voters who are not paying close attention that there's nothing to see here. Don't worry about it at all. Yeah, that's exactly what they're what they're trying to do. And uh, one thing I'm very pleased by, which has been a big change over the last four years or five years, really, and you've been a big part of this, is getting the mainstream of the Republican Party to start warning about the radical left. This was a big objection folks like Breitbart have had with the Republican establishment over the years is that they have not taken the wood to the left, so to speak. Now everyone does. And I think that's really terrific. It's a big development. And regardless of what happens in November, it has been reset that the Republicans are expected to warn America about the encroaching leftism. Uh, uh, Undoubtedly, and as the left has gotten angrier and and more filled with rage and really filled with hate, uh, the defining characteristic of the left today is hatred of Donald Trump. That that, that is the unifying thread through the Democratic side. Uh, and, and, and I will say I agree with you that we're seeing more Republicans who are willing to actually stand up and, and, and at least begin to fight. That, that is a major, major improvement uh, from where we started. And, uh, it, you know, far too often uh, the left goes in, into battles with deadly seriousness uh, and, and the right treats, treats it like a croquet match out on the, the front lawn. And, and that's, yes. a, that, that's a, a bad formula for success. Absolutely. And uh, you have an ad out, which is made the rounds a lot, it's getting a lot of virality on um, social media right now, where you talk about the stakes in November. And this is a good segue to the book because you, court packing comes up a lot. Um, uh, let's talk about the stakes and then we'll move towards talking about what's happening at the, in the judiciary right now. Uh, but let's talk about the stakes. What happens if you turn over power to particularly Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, but then potentially even the Senate hangs in the balance? Uh, s- set the stage for us. Well, I, I think the presidency and the Senate go hand in hand. I think we are likely to either win them both or lose them both. So if we wake up in January of next year, and Biden, Pelosi, and Schumer are running the federal government. I think the three of them would do more damage in two years than Obama did in eight. Uh, what would that mean? Well, one of the very first things that, that Schumer would do is end the filibuster in the Senate. That means then the Senate minority can do nothing, zero, to stop their radical agenda from being implemented. I think one of the, one of the first things Schumer would do after that is move to admit two new states to the United States, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. And then the reason they want to do that, they're, they're quite naked and crass about it. The Democrats believe those jurisdictions would elect four new Democratic senators. So we could start January with 50 Democratic senators and we could end the year with 54. And, and their focus is going to be entrenching power and making it very, very difficult for, for, for it ever to be taken away. We would then see massive tax increases, not just repealing the Trump tax cuts, but massive tax increases across the board. We'd see the Green New Deal, which which is estimated to cost ninety three trillion dollars, sixty five thousand dollars per household in America. 
we would see massive amnesty again because they want to entrench their their power. Uh, And in terms of the Supreme Court, I think we would see Democrats moving quickly to pack the court, to expand the court from nine justices, either to 11 or to 13, so that they can they they can go into next year with with a an extreme left majority, political majority that they just created on the court. Uh, And how do you think that that would be received by the public? Do you think the public would would go along with it? Because I do feel like that's the sort of thing that would really uh, not to say our political debate is less than toxic at this point, Senator, but it just seems like that would just that could set the country ablaze. You you know what? If if the public just elected Biden, Schumer and Pelosi, I think the public would yawn at it. I mean, mean, right now, right now, how do you think violent riots in our cities and burning our cities to the ground and and moving to abolish police would be received by the public? And in any sane or rational world, people would say, are you out of your mind? Like, like abolishing police is not a a reasonable argument in the sort of spectrum of arguments. It, it, It is a radical Marxist leftist idea to destroy society and. The media engages in pure propaganda, so they're packing the court. You got to remember, CNN every day would say, "Well, this is a justifiable response." Yes, to the that's right. Uh, uh, of Amy Barrett, and this is only reasonable and reciprocal. And of course, I mean, you, you, they would be justified if they even covered it. That, that they'd have a combination of rationalizing and justifying and ignoring it, uh, and you know that is the stakes. I have never seen the stakes as high as they are this year on election. Wow. It's amazing because I really, um, you know, I just find that argument very convincing. It was not uh, before you made it. I, I don't know if I, w- I was on the fence, but uh, that is, is very, very scary stuff. Again, Senator Ted Cruz uh, is with me. And uh, what does packing the court look like? How does this happen? How does it take place? And what is it? And um, before we even get there, the justification that because the president would do his constitutional responsibility and nominate someone and Mitch McConnell in the Senate um, and your colleagues in the Judiciary Committee would uh, confirm a nominee who's overly qualified and was just confirmed to a lower court three years ago. Uh, Why would that be justification to expand the court? And then what's the process to expand it? So this is all politics and they treat politics as warfare. Um, And President Trump in nominating Judge Barrett is doing exactly what he promised the American people. The Senate, we're going to confirm Judge Barrett before Election Day, by the end of the month. And in doing so, we're doing what we promised the American people. Packing the court just takes a statute. It doesn't take constitution in both houses. If they get rid of the filibuster, it takes a majority in both houses. And the stakes of it, you know, you, you, you mentioned my, my new book, One Vote Away. Uh, this One Vote Away g- details the stakes of it. And, and, and what it does, each chapter addresses a different constitutional liberty. So there's a chapter on free speech, something incredibly important to you and me and to Americans across the country. There's a chapter on religious liberty. There's a chapter on the Second Amendment. There's a chapter on U.S. sovereignty. There's a chapter on democracy and elections. And, and each chapter, it, it, what, what I do is, is tell war stories. Uh, But before I was in the Senate, I was a Supreme Court litigator. What what I did for a living is argue cases in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. And so I take the readers inside. I take the readers behind the curtain to understand what's really going on at the court. You know, a lot of people know, gosh, the court's important, but it's kind of confusing. You don't necessarily understand what are they doing? What's going on there? What does that mean? This book, you don't have to be a lawyer to enjoy this book, to, 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 to find it helpful. This is designed to help you understand really what's happening on the inside. And I focus on big landmark cases, many of which I personally help litigate. So I can, I tell the inside story of what was going on and what, what it, within the justices, with the litigants, with the history. And what is amazing on issue after issue after issue, the big landmark cases are five, four, we're just one vote away from losing our most fundamental liberties. That's what the stakes are in November. Uh, very interesting. Uh, would you mind sharing maybe a war story, one in particular that you think is particularly resonant for the audience? Well, sure. Uh, you know, one of the chapters on, on democracy and elections uh, talks about Bush versus Gore. And, and, and I was part of the legal team representing uh, George W. Bush. 
and and this is a situation that could easily replicate itself next month. Um, in 2000, I was a, a young lawyer. I was actually working on the Bush campaign down in Austin. Uh, met my wife, Heidi, down on the Bush campaign. We were in cubicles right down the hall from each other. And on election night, George W. Bush won. They counted the votes, and he won. But in Florida, the margin was very close. And so Al Gore sent in an army of lawyers to fi- file a series of lawsuits seeking to challenge the election. And the objective when you're doing that is they were trying to throw out as many George W. Bush votes as they could and trying to find as many new Al Gore votes as they could. So I got on a plane, flew to Tallahassee. I was on the ground for for the entire recount. Uh, You know, I got to tell you, it was utter and complete chaos. I I tell a story in the book that we had in the war room, a whiteboard with a chart of seven different lawsuits, all of which were simultaneously going on any one of which could could cost the presidency of the United States. I mean, it, it was nuts. The case went twice to the U.S. Supreme Court. The first time it went to the Supreme Court, we won unanimously. 9-0, the Supreme Court vacated the decision of the Florida Supreme Court, which was a partisan Democratic court, and sent the case back. The second time we went to the Supreme Court, on the, on the question of remedy, the final outcome in the case, The court divided five to four and five to four. The court said enough is enough. The ballots have now been counted four times. George W. Bush has won all four times under the law. You can't keep counting and counting and counting and trying to change the outcome. It's over. And that's why we had a result. Now, for 36 days, the country faced chaos for 36 days. Nobody in in the in the U.S. or across the world knew who the next president was going to be. And we have a real risk in November of seeing that tenfold. Uh, Instead of just one state, we could see litigation challenging the election in three, four, five states. Right. Uh, We could see it filed by Joe Biden. We could see it filed by Donald Trump. We could see it filed by both sides. There could be, uh, say, Trump wins Florida and Biden wins Arizona. It may be that the one campaign challenge is one and the other campaign challenge is the other. Uh, And it's one of the reasons why it is so important that the Senate confirm Judge Barrett, because if the Supreme Court only has eight justices, eight justices can divide four to four. And an equally divided court has no authority to decide anything. So if we have this chaos of litigation, If the Supreme Court is equally divided, there's no resolution and we're in a constitutional crisis. And and so I think that chapter helps people understand really what's at stake there and that we're one vote away. Look, there were four justices in Bush versus Gore that were happy to say, keep on recounting, keep counting till you find uh, find more more Al Gore votes. And and, and that exactly that's dangerous. And by the way, each other chapter, religious liberty, it is amazing how how close we are to losing the right to practice our faith without government getting in the way. Free speech. There are four justices ready to take away your and my political free speech, our right to criticize candidates. That, that's a fundamental free speech right. And, and yet the far left wants to muzzle and censor and silence us. And we're one vote away from that happening. Ted Cruz, again, is with me, Senator from Texas. One Vote Away is the new book just out last week, How a Single Supreme Court Seat Can Change History. In However you get your books, and I'm, I'm very platform agnostic with the books. I do the audio books, I do the Kindle, I do the hardcover. I don't do the audio CD, though allegedly there's an audio CD of it as well, Senator, which is uh, uh, kind of cool. I don't know who's <laughs> playing those, but I think I guess a few people are. You kind of preempted my last uh, line of questioning, which was mostly going to be about uh, what your predictions would be for the election. Election. First of all, if it went to the Supreme Court, let's let's walk through the scenario where it is four to four and um, uh, Barrett does not get confirmed by them, though I'm with you. I think it happens by them. But let's say it's still four to four. What's the process? Could you see a scenario? Do you have one that is in the back of your mind that you're thinking where you could have that constitutional crisis? Sure. I, I think it's very easy to imagine a four four divided court. And, and the problem is, let's take the scenario where there's litigation in Florida and Arizona. Sure. Arizona would go up to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Florida would go up to the Eleventh Circuit Court of Appeals. Those are two different federal courts of appeals. They could have contradictory outcomes. 
Uh, ordinarily, when, when federal courts of appeals conflict, you can go to the U.S. Supreme Court to get an answer. If the Supreme Court is divided 4-4, there is no answer. It, it, it just you stay in the chaos. And, and that's why I think it is so important to have wow. a fully functioning court. Um, a, 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 and it, it's important also to understand, look, look, the media and the Democrats treat this as, oh, you want a court who will just rig the election for Trump. No, that's not remotely what I want. Um, We're not nominating or confirming justices because they will vote for the political candidate we happen to favor. For one thing, justices typically serve 30, 40 years, and and that extends far beyond any particular election. What, what, What I want to see and what all of us should want to see is justices who will enforce the law, who will ensure if there is an election dispute that we follow federal law, and we follow the Constitution. Whichever candidate that benefits, we need to follow the law, and and we need a functioning Supreme Court to make sure that's happening. Okay, so the, the, agreed with on all those points. Are you concerned? How how concerned are you about election integrity? And this is something we're spending in a lot of time on the show. And I'm talking about two things in particular: a vote by mail, or as we call it, cheat by mail at Breitbart, and also another issue where you're pretty sharp on. Though it seems like there's very little that's actually gets done about this, which is tech uh, censorship and the way the the Silicon Valley tech giants could be manipulating their uh, functionality and their platforms in order to turn out the vote for certain people and not others, suppress information and not other information. Do either of these bother you? What's on your mind in this regard? I'm very worried about both. Both are happening and both are getting much, much worse. On the voter fraud side, voter fraud is a serious problem. Voting by mail is more susceptible to voter fraud. And in this election, the the, the hard left is so enraged that they're willing to rationalize the ends justify the means, that that anything is justified to defeat Trump, including lying, cheating and stealing along the way. And I think we're going to have a real issue where we have prosecutors who can be on top of it. They need to be on top of it and preventing it. But where you have Democratic jurisdictions, where the Democrats are controlling the state or the city, it's going to be a real threat. And and the simplest answer at this point, we're less than a month out now, we've got to win by a big enough margin that the Democrats can't steal it because they're going to try. On the second point, big tech, big tech censorship, is, I think, the single greatest threat to free speech and democracy in the country today. There are a handful of Silicon Valley billionaires who have amassed more power that, than, than ever seen before over, over information, uh, over, over the public square, over discourse. And big tech is, is brazen, is shamelessly silencing and censoring Conservatives censoring libertarians, censoring Trump supporters, censoring pro-Israel supporters, censoring pro-life supporters, censoring any views that that they disagree with. And and I, I chair the Constitution subcommittee, of the Senate Judiciary Committee. I've, I've chaired a series of hearings on big tech censorship. One of the witnesses who testified before the hearings was was Dr. Robert Epstein. Uh, who's a very respected psychologist. He did empirical analysis of Google in 2016. He concluded that manipulated and biased search results on Google shifted 2.6 million votes to Hillary Clinton. Now, what's interesting and amazing about Dr. Epstein, Dr. Epstein is not a Republican. He's a liberal Democrat who voted for Hillary Clinton and openly supported her. But he nonetheless was outraged that, that, that a giant Silicon Valley company was putting their finger on the scale and, and actively manipulating the election outcome. He also predicted in 2020, if they continue and accelerate what they're doing, they could shift 10 to 15 million votes to Joe Biden. That's what we're facing, and they are leaning in with all of their might. Silicon Valley is mad that Trump was elected. And so, yes, they are silencing us right now, and, and, and that means we need, to, we need to work harder. At this point, we're less than a month out from the election, so a, sure. a three-year study project ain't going to do it. Uh, That's right. We've got to mobilize and communicate despite their power and lies and manipulations, and then we need the seriousness of purpose within the administration 
to to bring enforcement actions and prosecution actions, which I have been urging the president and the attorney general and the administration to do for four years. Senator Ted Cruz, thank you for being on Breitbart News Daily, sir. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Let me encourage everyone again to go to Amazon, go to Barnes & Noble, wherever you get your books. Uh, the book is the number one bestseller in the country on Amazon. And if you want to understand more about the Supreme Court, what's going on there, if you want to understand more about the Bill of Rights, if you want to understand more about the stakes of this election in November, or if you want to understand more about this epic battle to confirm Judge Barrett, this book is clear, easy, fun, understandable, interesting. And I think it'll arm you at, at the water cooler or with friends and family as you're talking about the great issues of the day. Uh, it, it's, it, it will arm you with the tools and information you need. And, and so One Vote Away is the name of the book. Senator, appreciate it. Everyone go pick up the book right now. We'll take a break. Be right back. Be right back. Be right back.